Welcome to the Voice of San Diego at Home Edition, June 10th, 2020. Coming at you again from the uh, Voice of San Diego at Home studio at home in Ocean Beach. I am Scott Lewis, and uh, we've got a great show today. We're going to be doing a lot of things. We're going to be talking about defund the police. What does that actually mean? Uh, what happened in the city of San Diego? We're going to be talking about schools. Uh, lots to talk about there, and I'm going to bring on uh, managing editor Sarah Libby. She's uh, she's been tracking police and criminal justice reforms for quite some time, uh, and she's got a lot to help us understand and update about that. We have a lot of things, obviously, uh, crises galore to discuss and um, break down. But I really want to take today. Obviously, Wednesdays we try to take a, a, an opportunity to sit back, ask questions. Uh, what do you not understand about the county? The city of San Diego, the port of San Diego, San Diego Unified. What's the San Diego County Office of Education versus what's the San Diego County or, or San Diego Unified School District or Chula Vista Elementary School District? There's 47 school districts in San Diego. Uh, do you have questions about how that all works together? Uh, what is the city of San Diego's budget? How did that work? What did they do yesterday versus what uh, you know will they be doing over the next year? All these things are important questions. You know, they don't teach. Uh, they teach you what the Constitution is, what Congress is in, in school, uh, what the Supreme Court is, hopefully. But uh, there's very little uh, academies. There's very little in the way of academies set up so that you can understand how your own community works, what the Port of San Diego is. Do you know what Sandag is? You know what the local area formation uh, committee, I think it is, LAFCO is. There's lots of agencies in town and in the region that really decide how your uh, world looks and feels. And so we can go through that. But first, I got some good content for you. Got a great piece of content for you. We've got uh, a new member of the family here at Casa Lewis. Sit. Good boy. Do that again real quick. That is sit. Good boy. There it is. That is Rock Roque Rocky Lewis, a new member of our household. We've added a 14-year-old to the household. Um, you know, as I discussed before, my cousin, my uncle's daughter, has moved in with us to go to high school here. You know, good opportunity for her to, to have success. And, and now we've added a puppy. Not sure what else. Maybe a old car. <laughs> what else could we do uh, to make things interesting around here during the quarantine? Uh, if you have any suggestions, let me know. I, 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 Sit. Good boy. Sit. Good boy. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I will play. The Rocky clip any day, uh, anytime you want. Uh, all right, let's get into it. Lots of news about schools. Uh, obviously, I have been very concerned about what's going to happen to schools. Are they going to open schools? Are they going to keep with distance learning? What are we going to do with our kids? <laughs> and where are they going to go? Uh, like I said, I've got a house full of kids. Uh, there's one right now. I've got uh, a lot of questions about what's going to happen. So what is going to happen? We got a little bit more news this week. Let's go through uh, some of those. First off, this was um, San Diego's Unified School District Superintendent, largest school district in San Diego. Again, there's 47 school districts in the San Diego region. This is the largest one. Cindy Martin is the superintendent. And she's been doing this Tuesday kind of thing like I'm doing here, uh, talking to people about what's going to happen. And, you know, a few weeks ago, she and others said, we aren't opening. We can't open in good conscience if uh, we don't get a bunch more money than they're proposing at the state level. We need to hire nurses, counselors, masks. We have to buy sanitizer in a volume we can't even imagine. A lot of sanitizer. So here was San Diego Unified Superintendent Cindy Martin uh, with an update about where her head is about what we're going to be doing. The fact of the matter is that we know we have some students that are medically fragile, that it would be very dangerous for them to go back to an environment where they could be exposed, and students like that may need to stay in distance learning longer, and we want to make sure they have the support for that distance learning to be as successful as possible. So... A lot of things are going to happen 
she's going to do distance learning. We're going to have some campus. Not sure what that all means. We did get uh, a, a bit of news from Cajon Valley, Cajon Valley School District, Cajon Valley uh, Elementary School District says, we'll reopen for the 2021 school year in August. To accommodate individual family needs, students will have the option of 100% distance learning, a hybrid schedule, uh, two to three days a week, or a 100% online learning or distance learning or 100% classroom learning. So, so everything, <laughs> just going to do everything. We are just going to do everything. There was also um, an update from San Diego Unified. Let's, uh, let's get into that. There was a, uh, an update from the school district, uh, from Superintendent Cindy Martin. And she said that, let's see if I can pull this up. She said, for those families who can, I want to remind you about our critical board meeting. They're going to present their plan for how to open schools in San Diego Unified June 16th, starting at 3.30 p.m. You can go to their YouTube channel and you can watch it. Now, we've got some parents complaining that they haven't had a chance to actually weigh in. You can watch, but can you actually weigh in? Not so easy. Uh, she says in that the final shape of our school year, next school year, depends deeply on what the state legislature and governor do. The budget for them must be adopted June 15th, thus June 16th for their meeting. For that reason, we continue working with our local lawmakers to make sure we have the funding. But then she says at the end of that email, again, this is to San Diego Unified School District families. She says, as school leaders, we should commit to do more. So whatever option our students choose this fall, whether they choose to be on campus or working from home, they will have access to an outstanding education. Let's read that again. As school leaders, we should commit to do more. Now, this was in the context of the Black Lives Matter protests. So she was she says, like, protests and inequality are so important. And then she goes right to this sentence that says, as school leaders, we should commit to do more. So whatever option our students choose this fall, whether they choose to be home on campus or choose to be on campus or working from home, they will have access to an outstanding education. So it seems like, yeah, I got my Padres shirt on, huh? Someday they'll play baseball again. Would you guys go to a baseball game? All right. What we're hearing is that they're going to be doing everything <laughs> online, not online, whatever. We also got uh, from Chula Vista Elementary School District an update today. It said re recently Chula Vista Elementary School District reached out to our community. This was fascinating and surveyed parents about what they would do. 36% said they'd prefer to go back to campuses, physical campuses. 19% said they'd prefer virtual school, this distance learning, and 55% would prefer some sort of blended model. Now, Chula Vista Elementary School District would normally go back to school in July. They told parents today, today, that that's not at least going to happen until August 31st. That's their proposed return to school day. So figure out what you're going to do this summer, parents. Figure out what you're going to do. All right. All right. Let's talk for a second here. We have 47 school districts. Basically, last week, the state said, the state said, it's up to you to figure out what to do. Good luck. We hope it works out. We hope you get, you know, here's some guides. You should wear masks. The teachers should wear masks. You should distance. You should, all those things. And one of them, they said, we highly encourage, <laughs> this was my favorite, said, we highly encourage, um, uh, we, we highly encourage people to, they should encourage people who are sick to stay home. How about just tell them, stay the dip, stay home. If you're sick, stay home. We already have a question. Would you send your kids to school to a campus right now? Would you prefer online learning? I want to hear from you. Would you send your kid to school now if they said campuses are open, but you could also stay home and do distance learning, or you could try this hybrid? What would you do? 
Would you send your child to school? I asked, uh, we also heard this week from uh, uh, John Lee Evans. He's a school board member. He tweeted, quote, distance learning doesn't do it, doesn't do it. It's time to talk about physically reopening our schools with adequate testing, tracing, and affordable safety measures. We need to find a way to physically reopen schools in the fall. Partially reopening does not work for students or parents. So he's not into the hybrid model. He's not cool with uh, coming in and out. He wants regular schools open with testing and tracing. I asked the two people running for his seat, Sabrina Bazo and Crystal Troll, what they thought of their, of his statement and sabrina who's uh um got a lot of support she's supported by the teachers uh the san diego education association for example she says i definitely agree that students need to get back into the classroom distance learning is causing most many of our most vulnerable students to fall behind even further but she says but i have many questions and concerns about how the board plans to accomplish this we have to follow the cdc guidelines we have to hire nurses. We have to hire counselors, mental health counselors, custodial support. If we want to ensure our students' well-being, we will need much more in the way of additional funding for K-12 public education from the state and federal government than what is being proposed. This is the money, money quote of it. She says, I believe most parents and school staff would agree that these policies need to be put in place with funding to support them before the school doors reopen for our students. So I think she's kind of saying like, yeah, we should open them, not until we get a lot of money. Crystal Troll, who's running against her, she said, it's more than just testing and tracing that's involved. To me, the bigger issue is what distance learning will look like in the fall. No doubt some sort of distance learning will have to be factored into the plan because some, some families cannot return. What would you do? Would you send your child to schools? Uh, would you... Uh, your teacher would you go back what's it gonna be like wearing a mask if you're like teaching elementary kids you know sometimes they gotta look at your face to see what you're saying or understand maybe one of those face shields instead i don't know what's that gonna be like like to hear from you would you send your kid back to school you go okay with distance learning you considering a charter school or one of those homeschool programs let us know all right we have a special guest my friend managing editor sarah libby She's coming on. She's going to talk about some of these things. Let's see if I can pull her up. Hello. There she is. Hello, Sarah. Hey. Hey, Scott. How's it going? It's great. Everything's great. All right. <laughs> All right. Good. We have a lot to go over. Um, I, uh, I wanted to bring you on because you've been following criminal justice issues, uh, reform efforts from the police departments for some time. Had a lot of uh, context stored up uh, for the uh, uh, what's been happening now. I want to make a quick point. So there was this um, defund the police push. Uh, and it was a lot, very confusing. A lot of people broke their brains very, very hard. But I remember probably the most effective defunding of the police that I've seen in the last couple of years was a couple of years ago, the county super, uh, intendant supervisors, uh, five county supervisors, they oversee the budget of the sheriff's department. There's a bunch of deputy sheriffs that serve as the police force for the unincorporated areas and for many of the small cities. They cut their pensions. 2.5% of their salary times the number of years served uh, is what they got instead of 2.7% times the number of served. So if you had a, a deputy who served 25 years at a salary of $125,000, they'd have an annual pension starting at $84,000 before this. And now after this cut, $78,000. So they defunded the police to fund other needs, but nobody's triggered about it. Nobody's upset. Even the, the deputy sheriff still supported one of the Republicans who did that. Yeah, I don't think that's necessarily what people are talking about when they're no. making these calls, but no? yeah. that is true. Yeah, I think there's like two. Uh, tell me if you agree. There seems like there's two takes on defund the police. One is they should dissolve down all the corporate, all the structures of these agencies and rebuild them from the ground up about what they need for community policing and so on. And then there's another version that says we should find whatever cuts we can find and redirect that money to other needs. 
Is that a fair summary, do you think? Yeah, I think that's kind of the policy needle that a lot of people are trying to thread right now. There are, of course, these like just general angry, angry calls to like dismantle the entire system and reimagine it in a new way. And then there are people who are like actually working on the budget processes right now who are trying to decipher like what that actually might look like in the current confines that we have. I think it's a little, uh, it's, you know, sad that so many people are paying attention to this issue suddenly, right as like literally the San Diego (laughs) city of San Diego is finishing this process. And so, you know, we saw that marathon city council meeting a few days ago where people were waiting for hours to um, weigh in. And yet it seemed like at that point it was already like a done deal. Yeah. So tomorrow, uh, just a quick plug, we're going to have Georgia Gomez. She's the council president for the San Diego City Council. She, uh, well-known progressive in town uh, and and was, you know, probably one of the biggest forces on this budget getting passed. You know, we'd l- like to talk to her about all those different uh, decisions she made. But there's a lot of things in there that she, Monica Montgomery and others fought for to get into that budget. Uh, Monica Montgomery represents... Uh, District 4, who was really swept into office by her own marshalling of this movement, uh, this particular movement, uh, and the frustrations that it had with her predecessor, um, Myrtle Cole. And she gets money in this new budget for a race and equity office. Uh, Pretty significant achievement, frankly, in a week where we saw a dizzying number of of reforms go through. Yeah, I I think... um... It's so interesting to see some of the things that the budget did fund alongside these calls for, you know, people are outraged that the budget did include a big increase for police. And so it's a weird juxtaposition to be watching play out in real time. But again, you know, I think if some of these uh, protests and discussions were happening three months ago, it seems pretty clear the budget would look much different than it does now. Yeah. Well, let's talk about one of the pieces of reform. You talked last week to Andreas St. Julian, who's um, the author behind uh, an effort, the long running effort to overhaul the sort of independent commission that oversees police misconduct reviews. And um, suddenly it got last week an endorsement from the mayor of uh, San Diego, Mayor Kevin Faulkner, uh, from the chief of police, uh, the 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 police officers union um, said it was okay to go forward. Um, What uh, do you think it's everything? Have we heard yet? If it's everything that the activists wanted? No, I I haven't gotten any sense um, that we know the specifics. And, you know, of course, Andrea St. Julian was very skeptical um, that it would be as strong as the measure that she originally wrote. And she was, you know, a little offended to hear, Um, All these city officials say that they supported the measure when no one has necessarily articulated what the measure looks like now. It's still in this um, closed process of meet and confer between the city and the unions. And so we're all really anxious to see what reforms they're actually putting on the table. There's sort of three main parts of it, though, right? Can you go through what the actual um, main issues are here, subpoena power, things like that? Yeah, so one of them is subpoena power, which is um, the ability of the agency to demand uh, documents and depositions um, separate from what the police department provides to them. So right now they're limited entirely to what um, the department's internal affairs uh, piece of the agency provides to them. And that, you know, leaves a lot of things um, out of view for them to really weigh in on on what happened in some of these really gnarly issues. And so subpoena power um, is important to them. Uh, and Andrea St. Julian said that even if they never use the subpoena power in, in practice, um, having that kind of in their back pocket is really important to them because it might compel people to provide things without them even having to use it. Um, and then another piece of it, um, you know, which you talked a bit about with Mara Elliott, the city attorney, is that right now um, their legal counsel is the city attorney's office, who also represents uh, police officers when they're sued um, in these instances. And so, you know, even if the city contends 
um, that there isn't a conflict in those two things happening si simultaneously. Everybody seems to agree that the optics are pretty bad and, and would like to change that. Yeah. Uh, we also saw a dizzying fast movement on the, the so-called choke holds. Uh, and what other sort of that, what, what other sort of reforms are we waiting to see progress on or discussions about? It seems like there were some things that obviously people in power were willing to jump on right away. Uh, but there's some larger discussions that we're still sort of waiting on the, uh, transparency issues and such. Yeah. Um, you know, I follow a lot of statewide issues and there's actually not a lot that's currently on the table because of the way the legislature has been impacted by the coronavirus. Everybody's had to really pare back all the things that they were hoping to move forward. Um, and so they are working on a, a statewide bill to eliminate the chokeholds and the carotid restraints. And so we saw everybody in San Diego do that really quickly. And so now there's a similar movement afoot to make that a statewide policy. Um, but as far as new reforms, there's not a lot currently on the table. I think the thing that I've kept closer tabs on is the extent to which departments are complying with existing reforms. So you mentioned um, police records, and KPBS had a great report today about what we know about how San Diego officers use force. Um, and their reporting found that force was far more likely to be deployed against black residents um, than white residents. But they noted that the records are incomplete because the law, law enforcement agencies haven't provided them under the law as they're required to. Uh, talk about the case of um, one of the ones that we followed very closely for years was the case of Fridun Nahad, um, a, uh, a you know, troubled man who was uh, shot in the Midway District, um, literally within seconds upon encountering a police officer. Um, he turned out to be wearing, uh, holding a pen in his hand, but uh, was mistaken for a knife uh, and, and he was killed. And one of the parts that you and I both focused on after that was just how um, there was no official acknowledgement that that was not the ideal outcome of that encounter, that there was a lot of like, it was justified shooting. There was a whole bunch of like explanations that it was okay, that it wasn't criminal what the police officer had done, but there was never a real like discussion or reckoning that maybe that wasn't the best outcome for that encounter and how we might avoid, avoid that uh, to happen in the future. And that was a really um, uh, frustrating moment. We've learned a lot still about that case since then. And it's something that continues to interest you. Why? Yeah. So first of all, the civil rights lawsuit filed by uh, Ferdun's family is still going forward. And it's a uh, pretty interesting, you know, these sorts of cases have a really high bar. And so the fact that a court has validated that um, it should go forward is kind of big news in and of itself. The court expressed a lot of um, concern about how the incident unfolded. And one thing I've found really interesting is, you know, this incident happened back in 2015. So um, it wasn't subject to this new uh, use of force law that was recently passed by Shirley Weber. Um, but it's always struck me as kind of like the perfect example of a case that might be treated a lot differently under this law. And so, you know, as you said, um, legally, the department and the D DA's office has said, well, he didn't, you know, um, he didn't do anything criminal under the law at that time. And I think that they might come to a different conclusion if they were governed by the parameters of this new use of force uh, bill in which, um, you know, use of force is only justified if somebody presents a, an immediate threat to somebody's life. And the fact that this officer um, didn't announce himself as police, um, didn't try to talk to the suspect um, in any way. He didn't provide any commands that um, he, you know, like disobeyed. He didn't say put down the pen that you were holding um, and he didn't comply with that. He just immediately exited his vehicle um, and shot him. And even that decision to get out of the vehicle, um, you know, kind of put him in a situation where he felt that he had to shoot him. And so those are the types of decisions that are now looked at a bit differently under this new law. Hmm. Fascinating. Uh, all right. Well, talk for a second about 
yeah, I'm trying to help people understand what you do and and what your job is. You've got a bunch of stories. Uh, most of the stories we kind of think about as a group, we come up with ideas, but then you're in charge of, of uh, you know, marshalling the vast majority of them through our system and getting them up to standards. What's your role and, and what are you guys working on right now? Yeah, so I'm kind of um, have my hands in everything that the site does. I'm having constant discussions with um, reporters about what they're working on and how we can kind of take what's happening in the news and and pivot off it for some more in-depth investigations and explanations. And so obviously a lot of those right now are focused on the police and we have all this um, context to draw from of years of having covered this issue. And so I think um, part of our service right now is some resurfacing a lot of that um, reporting in order to provide people some new context who are kind of tuning into it just now or looking at it in a new light in regard, um, given everything that's happened over the last few months. Um, so that's part of it. And, you know, uh, on top of actually editing each story and providing feedback, like so much goes into these investigations um, for some of the more serious ones, like the ones that involve police, they involve um talking to our lawyers um, and having them vetted to ensure that, you know, we're doing everything right uh, legally um, and, you know, uh, helping people get the support they need to get records to do these investigations, which often is a big challenge um, and doing a lot of that type of work. Yeah, cool. Let's take one of these questions. Uh, this one's interesting to me. When the city budget was passed this week, it seemed like it was in its final stages. It was the end of the process. What would have been the penalties or drawbacks to changing the budget at that point? Uh, let me uh, take a stab first. Ben, thanks for the question. Um, I think what's one thing to keep in mind, so the mayor proposes his budget, you know, six weeks ago or whatever. Um, and after that, there's a series of hearings that occur where the city's budget um, committee you know, ask a bunch of questions. Each sort of department gets a chance to make its case for what it's doing. Uh, remember also, so suddenly a budget that was pretty strong, maybe facing a, a minor historically, but a significant budget deficit suddenly was cast into this economic catastrophe. And so they faced immediately a $350 million budget deficit. So they had to find $350 million somewhere. Now the federal government came in and said, here's 250, <laughs> good luck. And they've decided that they could use most of that to apply to the deficit. Um, so you're already faced with this really uh, wrenching decision making. Uh, so they spend the next few weeks, the, the um, independent budget analyst comes out with a, a report on the budget and suggests different ways that they might be able to protect some services, keep some libraries open, for example, and make some other cuts in different areas. And so they adopted all of those things. Monica Montgomery got her... Um, uh, our office for race, racial equity and, um, in place where the, they could review these things. A lot of, um, sort of horse trading occurs where they uh, make deals and try to get forward. But then a, a really important part is at the same time, the city is negotiating its, uh, its, uh, labor agreements with the, not just the police officers, but the municipal employees association, the largest employee union, uh, the, the blue collar workers that, you know, work in trash and other things. And so one of the problems is you can't really change much when you make those deals. You have to go back through the whole process of negotiating. And so, um, you know, that's that's not, you know, th that's not just to explain the process. That really is like a significant hurdle that they get through. So they made a deal with the Police Officers Association, and now that's uh, reflected in the budget. Now, can you really just rip that up? And you can't. So it's um, a lot of things that the law and their own practices now make clear, but also I think there's something happening where people are kind of brushing off uh, Georgette Gomez and Monica Montgomery's like, like they were just sort of bullied into this or they didn't know what they didn't know what was happening. Like they were just kind of like naive or something and they, they it was railroaded. And I think that's a real disservice to them. Like they're smart people who knew exactly what was happening and had major influence. Yeah, they're working within the system that they work in. Right. Right. So, um, yes, there, the mayor did demonstrate last or two years ago that he has significant power with the budget, that he can, without uh, a two thirds majority from uh, the city council, he can uh, kind of manipulate the budget as he pleases. Um, now, he it was small kind of what he did, you know, cutting some council budgets and stuff like that. But uh, the mayor does have strong uh, powers with the budget that we we've continued to understand better. 
Um, so, you know, he could have uh, retribution that comes if he doesn't like something that's happened, but a lot of things happen that they, that they really wanted to happen. So um, let's see if there were some other questions here. Some people have suggested uh, taking guns away from the police. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of talk about that, that if you disarm the police, one of the problems though, I think, and I'm surprised police aren't on the forefront of more uh, firearm regulation uh, movements because it, they, you know, the fact that people do have firearms in the community and that those might pop up at any time is part of why they're so, what they say, so scared, right? That's what we hear about. Yeah, and I think this push really dovetails with the defund the police uh, movement in which, you know, people are saying police handle so many situations um, that are perhaps better suited for social workers and mental health uh, counselors and things like that. And so if somebody is having a true uh, mental health episode, perhaps somebody with a gun shouldn't respond to that. Right. Well, Sarah Libby, uh, thank you for joining. Appreciate it. Uh, my tens of fans here at the, <laughs> at the Casa Lewis are, are uh, pleased to have you and I appreciate all you're, all you're doing for voice. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, all right. Cheers. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, that's a lot going on there. I uh, appreciate um, all your readership and support. Let's just break down again really quickly what we're talking about. The city of San Diego uh, represents, you know, about um, uh, 1.3 million people in this in the region, but the entire region is overseen by the county of San Diego, which itself is kind of an arm of the state. Um, I think it's important to remember that because the county of San Diego offers and runs the budget for the sheriffs. And the sheriffs patrol the areas that are outside the city of San Diego and some cities where um, uh, the cities have decided that the sheriff should be their police department. Not La Mesa, which has its own police department. Not El Cajon, which have, has its own. National City has its own. But several other communities don't have their own. They use the sheriffs as places like uh, along the coast. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, if you're ever interested in some of this stuff, um, I really recommend VOSD.org slash SD101. It's VOSD.org slash SD101. Go on there. There's a discussion of the difference between a county and the city, or what sand egg is, where we get our water. Um, there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people newly interested in San Diego public affairs right now. And um, I think uh, this is an opportunity for people to get up to speed. So the next time the budget's going through, they know who's doing it and they can be a part of that process from the beginning and make things uh, happen that they wanna see happen. Uh, there's a lot that can happen just by being involved. And if you don't know where to start, go to vosd.org slash SD101. Uh, check that out. Uh, hopefully we can place it in the comments too. Um, and I think it, it's a way to um, make sure you can follow what's happening with all these things. All right, let's take some more comments. Would you send your kids to school? Uh, what do you think about uh, um, COVID-19 these days? Are you comfortable? Um, we got a question here I wanted to take uh, from somebody overseas. Uh, let's see if I can find that one. Uh, uh, it was a question about what the state of the lockdown is in San Diego. We're partying, baby. We were opening bars. We're opening gyms Friday. Uh, I went to the beach uh, a couple days ago, and it was packed, just packed. The the parking lot opened yesterday. Um, people are, you know, it's funny. You're not supposed to get together with your friends, but you can sit right next to other people <laughs> on the beach. Not right next to, but, you know, pretty much. Uh, so it's a little awkward. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's still some hot spots of the virus. I don't know if we've decided that we've contained it, but remember there's three triggers that the county has set in place, unanimously set in place by the county supervisors that they're really watching. One is they can't let outbreaks, more than seven outbreaks happen. They're gonna start rolling things back if more than seven outbreaks happen. Second is uh, um, the uh, um, level of, of symptoms and diseases. And then third, of course, is the uh, availability of protective equipment. Do the hospitals have the protective equipment they need to handle this? I'm sorry, the, the second one was the capacity issue. Do they have the capacity at the hospitals to handle these cases? And do they have the equipment to handle these cases? If they still have those. They're not going to shut things back. They're not going to roll things back. But if one of those triggers, if one of those triggers is pulled, back to quarantine, baby, back to quarantine. All right, let's take some other questions. 
Uh, Catherine, oh, my friend Catherine says, uh, I want my kids in school. Do you want your kids in school? Tell me, what do you need to see to be able to send your kids back to school? Would you be reluctant to if everyone has to wear masks, if they can't walk in the different directions, they have to walk in the same direction, they can't have recess, that kind of thing. Would that turn you off? Would you go to a homeschool platform or not? Uh, a lot of people want to get back to school. A lot of people are very nervous about it. Uh, let's go on. Um, let's see, we've got one here. Could you please give us an update on where the climate action plan stands now? I heard the study needed to update the plan was in jeopardy. Any update on that effort is appreciated. Well, I don't have the answer right on hand, but I do recommend you follow Mackenzie Elmer from our staff. Mackenzie Elmer, she does a bi-weekly environment review. I'm sorry, environment report that comes out Monday. So check that out. Go to our site, voiceofsandiego.org. Check out the newsletters tab. Sign up for the environment report. She's going to give you all that stuff right in your inbox. And she's the one you want to follow because she's awesome. She explains things really well. Big fan, Mackenzie Elmer. Check out her environment report. Go to vosd.org. Go to voicesofshanigo.org. Check out the newsletters and sign up for the environment report. Uh, I believe uh, the climate action plan did get what it wanted from the budget. The, uh, the sustainability office did get what it wanted from the budget. So it is going forward if that helps. Um, okay. Is it allowed to swim at the beach? It is. Everything's allowed at the beach now, except partying. <laughs> you can't party with other people. You're allowed to be at the beach, but you can't party with other people. Yeah, kids will touch all the time. They do. That's that's the hard part. All right. Uh, any other questions? Uh, what do you want to know about how the uh, the city works? How the school districts work? Um, Sandag, all these questions. Do you know what these things are? What do you want to know about how the community works? Voice of San Diego is one that gives you that uh, info. That's what we do to help you understand your community better and, and want to get to there. All right, a couple of things. Tomorrow, Georgette Gomez is going to join. We're going to do a special at-home edition. We don't normally do Thursdays. We're going to do a special at-home edition right here, 1.30 p.m. Georgette Gomez, San Diego City Council President. Come with your questions. She's ready. Uh, we're going to have a good discussion. She's always up for it. Uh, we've had a, a lot of interesting talks with her over the years. I remember when she was just an activist uh, with uh, gigantic, you know, earrings and and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of spirit. And and now she's uh, she's been in charge for a while. Now she's running for Congress. Very interesting person in the city of San Diego. And uh, we're going to talk to her about that budget and about some of the criticism that has come from it and other things going on. So uh, bring your questions on that. Uh, who do you complain to regarding the San Diego City Council? Well, that's the thing. They're set up to take your complaints. San Diego City Council, there's nine members of San Diego City Council. They are all very accustomed to taking your complaints. That's what they're best at. Uh, they will uh, they will absorb it well, nod their heads, and, uh, and if you're lucky, they'll do something about it. Um, so that's where you do. All right, guys, I appreciate your time. Uh, uh, stay tuned again tomorrow afternoon right here, 1.30 p.m. Uh, we are going to have that discussion with Georgia Gomez. It's part of a sort of live recording of our podcast interview. Bring your questions for her tomorrow at 1.30. All right. Thank you all for your time, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.